You're all good. And then Seth, I'll, I'll start admitting people because they're one minute from starting. Hi, people. We are just getting all set up for this session. Okay. Now Seth is in charge of helping people come in. It is right at two o'clock, so I'll get us started. And if you missed the beginning, you can go catch that on YouTube. Couple of housekeeping things. We are in a Zoom meeting for this session, not a webinar. So to ask your questions, make sure to do that in the chat and to make them kind of prominent. And if I miss a question, don't be afraid to like use all caps to shout at me in the chat and let me know that I did. We have a few things going on this week with Newsletter Fest that I mentioned at the beginning of every session. And I try to do it like as rapid pace as I can. Like, um, I wish I could be like, do you remember the micro machines, man? A boop, 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 boop. Um, so what I want to mention is that there is a Slack community. Seth is going to join, uh, drop the link to join that. That is a, a Newsletter Fest Slack community that is for the event, but it is intended to live on after the event to keep newsletter creators connected. If you don't mind hitting record as well, Seth. Um, we also have a contest going on where you can win a free year of curated. If you have a big subscriber list, that's a big win and we don't have many um, people competing in that just yet. So what you do is go in and start up a free account. Um, just don't activate it and you can enter to win and the three prize winners will be announced on Friday. We also have the vote for your favorite newsletter of 2021 thing going on because we have crowdsourced nominees for the best newsletters in several categories that you can go check out. So that's it for me. Now I am honored to introduce Eric Barnes of the Daily Memphian, who is going to talk to us about how they used email to break through 15,500 paid subscribers for their local news site. So welcome, Eric. We're so excited to have you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, just in time to start, I screwed up my machine, but I, everything is going to be fine. Everything is going to be just fine. It's going to be wonderful. I promised people before this whole thing started that I would figure out ways to mess things up. Yeah, yeah, well, that was complete user error. So uh, yes, thanks for having me. I'm uh, very glad to be here. Um, and for people joining, thank you for being here. And you, um, I guess I can try to watch the chat too and I'll talk for a while and then I'll kind of stop and see if people want to ask questions. I would much prefer, you know, having kind of a conversation than just talking at everyone. I think we've all been talked at a lot in Zoom in the last 13 months. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. D don't hesitate to interrupt me or, you know, uh, again, because it's a, it's a it's a tidy number, so so it's not going to throw me off in the slightest. Yes, it's going um, to be intimate, is what yes, I have is, decided. Is, <laughs> absolutely. So so just I'll, I'll start just a little bit of overview of the Daily Memphian, which um, is. A, a, gets into the email story, but I, I kind of can't tell the part of the, the daily, the, the story of emails for us without going back to some history. We are, um, I am first of all, um, first of all, the, the publisher and CEO of the Daily Memphian. Uh, I've been a journalist in some form or fashion for 30-ish years, um, been on the business side and always kind of back and forth and right now both, which is why I have this goofy microphone because I also, um, Besides running the Daily Memphian, I host a show on our local PBS affiliate, a weekly news show, and I have a, a, a news interview show on, on a local radio station here. And so I say that only just because I'm not just the business guy, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm also, I am still a working journalist, which sort of informs a lot of what we do on the Daily Memphian and, and with email on the site and so on. Um, we, uh, so what is the Daily Memphian? Daily Memphian launched in September of 2018, so about two and a half years ago. We are a locally owned, purely locally focused, uh, digital only uh, news site. We uh, have a newsroom of about 35 full-time reporters, editors, journalists, photographers, and another 20 freelancers at any given time, kind of any given week. Um, and we cover everything. Um, we cover uh, everything from high school sports to food, to city and county government, to schools, to arts and culture, our mission, we are not a niche uh, uh, 
you know, site. Not there's anything wrong with that, but just we are meant to be kind of, our editorial mission is that of a, of a classic daily newspaper. We mm -hmm. publish uh, content, you know, 15, 10 to 25 stories a day, seven days a week. Um, pretty much, you know, from the morning, somewhere around six uh, till midnight or later, depending on city council and, and uh, sports and so on. And other times when news breaks overnight, obviously. Um, we were launched uh, very much in reaction to uh, the cutting of our local paper. And this, at this point, I'll share um, my screen. And I won't do too much of this, but I'm going to do a little bit. And this is a story. Can you see that Daily Memphian slide? Is that there? I can. OK, great. So um, we all sort of know this story of, of, oops, I did this out of order. We know this story of what's happening to local newspapers around the country. You know, So a lot of us probably, if you're remotely involved with journalism, know these stats that more than 2,000 local newspapers have gone out of business. Um, 35,000 newspaper jobs were eliminated through 2019. God knows how many were, 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 were eliminated in the last year and won't come back. You've got ghost papers all around the country um, that, you know, basically they operate, but they operate with maybe one or two reporters. Um, and obviously the, the, the big takeover and, and, and chaining together of local news has been going on for quite some time. And now, you know, much of it private equity backed, hedge fund backed, or very debt laden, or all three. And in our case, what we were launched against this backdrop was this was the commercial appeal was a legacy Scripps Howard paper, 150 years old, is still operating today. And there's some, I always want to say, there's some great journalists there. This is not about the journalists who remain at the commercial appeal. But it, we were launched in, in, in reaction to the kind of corporate takeover and corporate um, gutting of our paper. So as the slide shows from, you know, give or take 2003 to present, um, they went from 250 local journalists to now just about 27 on their masthead. Um, and four owners in give or take five years and just cutting and cutting and cutting. And so um, people got very frustrated. A lot of the journalists there got frustrated. The, the kind of business, civic, just interested community, people in Memphis who were worried about what was happening, um, were getting more and more agitated about not having a local paper. Um, and ultimately, when Gannett took over, and again, this I will get to the email part because it is essential to this. When Gannett took over, they own own now and owned the, the Memphis paper, Jackson, Nashville, Knoxville, and a bunch of, of kind of community suburban papers. So they had four of the largest, five largest cities in the state, and they launched what they called the Tennessee Network. And so they began to share content across all the properties. And so we would get, Memphis would get, um, you know, stories, top 10 rooftop bars in Nashville, and Nashville would get stories about Memphis, um, you know, schools, and Knoxville would get stories about Nashville, Memphis, and so on and so forth. And the, the reality is that, you know, Memphis, quote, hates Nashville. Nashville hates Memphis. And we all hate Knoxville, and they all hate us. <laughs> and, and so, and this is true of every state I've ever lived in. I've lived in Alaska, Washington, California, Connecticut, New York. Upstate New York and downstate New York are entirely different places. Eastern Washington and Western Washington are entirely different places. California is really three states, if you get down to it. So Alaska is the same. So it was a f just a foolish idea that made sense on a PowerPoint and on a whiteboard, but made no sense in Memphis, let alone in Nashville or Knoxville or their other markets. And when they did that, and then they cut 20 people on a spring day some years ago, we got serious and we launched, um, we got serious, raised money, formed the Daily Memphian in May, the, we incorporated in May of 2018 and launched in September of 2018. And email, as I'll start getting farther and farther into, has been essential to what we, what we do. And it's important to note that we are a paywall-driven site, a hard paywall. Um, you get three free articles, and then you got to pay us. Um, we launched at $7 a month. We're now at, with, give or take, it's either $99 a year or $10.99 a month. And um, that is how we're going to survive, is if we can get enough subscribers plus some advertising. And um, we knew that we wouldn't um, uh, give away a bunch of content for free. We wouldn't go a voluntary membership route. There are people who have done that successfully, and that's totally fine. We wanted to um, tell people that what, and we wouldn't discount heavily. We would not do dollar a month, a dollar for three months. I mean, I got an offer recently from a Gannett paper that was uh, uh, $12 for 12 months. It was a 98% discount. And uh, we knew we didn't want to do that for a lot of reasons. One, we couldn't afford it. Two, we felt it sent a message that it devalued the, the, 
the product that we were putting out and the content we were putting out. Um, and three, um, we had a feeling like wh who's serious about subscribing if they're only paying a dollar a month. Um, the other thing was we would give a lot of content away for free. You get three free per month. Truthfully, that's three free per device, per browser. So you can, without even trying to cheat us, you can get a lot of free content. And we knew um, that we give a lot away in email, that we put a lot of content, teaser content in email that would not cost any money. You could subscribe to that for free. Uh, and we knew from research and talking to a lot of other kind of papers who were doing it right around the country digitally, because we're digital only, we did not have a print edition, we knew that, um, that email was the best way to convert people to paid subscribers. You know, there was a, a, a big paper who's done, locally owned paper that's done digital very successfully that found that, you know, a, a Facebook follow versus an, a sign, a, a, somebody who signed up for a free email newsletter, the person who signed up for the free email newsletter was 25 times more likely to buy a paid sub. And we, so, and we heard that from other people. And that has basically, I can't remember what our number is right now, I should know that, but it has basically paid out for us. Email is the absolute best lead generation for our lifeblood, which is paid um, um, uh, subscriptions. Um, and so now what that means is we have, and I'm gonna unshare, so we don't have to stare at that screen forever, and the depressing decline of local journalism here. Um, we have two and a half years later, like I said, we have about 57,000 email subscribers. Um, that's across about 20 different newsletters. I'll talk more about what those are made up of. Um, we are, in the last year, we've added around 2,000, 2,100 emails per month to various newsletters, you know, um, as uh, we, um, and again, as I said, email is our best source of paid subs and quality traffic. Um, we are at, as of uh, 20 minutes ago, 15,604, to be exact, uh, paid um, subscribers to our site who pay for access to the site. Our goal is to get to 25,000 uh, by the end of year, um, uh, the end of the fifth year, end of 2023. And we, our goal is to get the net rate up, whereas right now it's right around $9, nine and a quarter, depending on how you pay for it, or what plan you choose, to get that up to about 10, ideally $11 a month, uh, depending on the plan. And then that would generate about $3 million. We, would, we, we generated just under a million dollars in advertising last year. We hope to get that up to a million five. We've got about a $5 million budget and we've got some other ancillary income that would fill that gap. So that we are not necessarily making a ton of money, but we are self-sufficient by the end of year five. Um, so uh, we have multiple, like I said, 20, about 20 different email um, newsletters that we send. They range from you know, breaking news, which can be one to three times a day, to weekly, to even some monthlies. I'm gonna share my screen to show you one of them, to show you, and you can go to dailymemphian.com slash email and see what I'm showing, but I'll just do it here for kicks and for posterity. Um, this gives you a list of all of them. So this is everything from, uh, on a daily, we have the breaking news, which is again, as it happens, we have um, daily, uh, a morning edition, which is what I'm gonna really focus on today, which is, you know, uh, basically a summary of the day's news with teaser headlines, and I'll show that when I get deeper into it. We have an afternoon update that is just headlines that comes out. Um, we have a very, those are f stories picked by an editor, but sent automatically. We have a highly curated written morning, it's called the early word, one of our editor writers does it every day. She picks probably seven to 10 stories, has a kind of a take and a funny, you know, point of view on the, or sad, you know, kind of more personal point of view on the day's news. That goes out every, um, every five days a week. We do a lunchtime read that goes out, um, uh, you know, that maybe it's a, kind of an in case you missed it type uh, email around lunchtime, you know, just something you might want to read, might be heavy, usually it's pretty light. We do the same at night, most nights kind of an in case you missed it, you know, story of the day. Um, same on the weekend, a weekend read. Then we do a lot of weekly um, um, email newsletters. So you can see here like high school sports, that's a weekly recap of, the, of, of everything that happened in high school sports this week or podcasts or metros, everything in you know, the city and county. We have a neighborhood one. The weekly ones vary from semi-automated where they are an editor goes through and picks maybe 10 stories, the 10 most important high school sports stories of the last week and then hits go. Then we have some highly curated ones like our Grizzlies Insider, Memphis Grizzlies, a very popular basketball team here, 
NBA team. And that's written by our Grizzlies beat writer. He picks some stories. He, it's its own article. And we do that with Tigers basketball. We do that with food. And um, increasingly, we kind of split the difference on some things like our suburban uh, weekly suburban newsletter where the, su- the suburbs editor writes a kind of quick thing on top about just kind of summarizing what was going on and having a take on the week. And then it lists out stories. All those are free. Um, and all those are meant to just drive traffic to the site. So people, I mean, callously burn up their three, three free clicks and have to pay us money to keep reading. Um, we will, um, this is also, and I'll come back to this later, this is also the page at which you manage your email preferences. So, and that's a hugely important thing. I mean, unbelievably important thing. And I say that as a, somebody who runs a company that did not have this when we launched. And we, had, we were at 10 newsletters, maybe even 15, before we launched this very simple one place, go and manage your email preferences. That sounds really stupid, and I am going to focus at the end here on a lot of dumb things we did. Um, so this is not just us celebrating how great we are. We've been very good at certain things, and we've been really dumb, I have, about uh, other things. This email page, which we got up, this email management page, was um, uh, a smart thing we did that we should have had when we launched. But I'm going to close that, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. And um, so what else about, you know, we use, before I kind of dive into that morning edition, which is really our flagship, like most important email product. And I'll bring up an example of it when I dive into it. A couple more background things. Um, one more, we will be launching email on demand uh, fairly soon. That's sort of if you want to just get every time, Jeff Calkins is our most popular writer. He writes about sports and community. And if you want that, you want to know exactly when Jeff's story goes up, you can sign up to get email on demand. We've also set it up so you can do specific writers or specific topics. So if you're just really into, um, uh, what's an example, suburban coverage, every time a, su- a suburban story goes up, you'll get an email that says, a little tease, a headline, click here and go through. Um, we, uh, we also sell um, uh, advertising on our emails. And so last year we did about a quarter million dollars in uh, of the nine, uh, it was about what, 25% of the near million dollars we had in advertising and sponsorships. Um, we hope to break, get up to about 300,000 this year um, in email ads. And they're, I won't say they're, e- selling is never easy, but they are some of the easiest things to sell. Once you have a good topic, you have a, a good number of, of um, subscribers to them, there are advertisers who want them. Our advertising on that can be as low as three or $400 per month up to the premier ones are probably a thousand to almost fifteen hundred dollars and we sell just if you do sell ads on email newsletters just a side note we do a flat rate we don't do it you know you're going to pay a penny per or a dollar per local advertisers by and large we sell all of our advertising on the site directly we don't use any network advertising we sell all of it you know person to person zoom to zoom phone to phone email to email all local businesses from FedEx, which is headquartered here, down to a corner store. And for the most part, while the FedExes of the world are really into you know, paying per view and the metrics and the analytics, the bulk of our advertisers really want a simple ad buy. And they want a fair price to be next to content of value and have their ad in front of people who are in the demographic they're trying to reach. And they want to pay a reasonable amount for that and they don't want to sweat, is it going to be $362 this month or is it going to be $574 because of open rate and clicks and so on? Now, there are a lot of people who do it that way and make a lot of money. I'm just saying that we have found that the very simple rate card that is, you know, top of the email is most expensive, middle than, than lowest, the pricing goes down, the bigger lists have a higher price, the smaller lists have a lower price. Very rudimentary, and it works really well, particularly for small business type advertisers. Okay, I have a couple of yeah. questions to interject with that. One would be, are are you finding that these local advertisers are, are more satisfied with just the fact that their brand is seen, like in the newsletter yes. or are they focused on conversions like click-throughs? Mostly a uh, brand. Okay. We do a lot of B2B advertising. Um, so local insurance companies, local banks, local um, commercial real estate companies. Um, and they are less consumed with, I got this many clicks and this sold this many brake pads. 
So, so uh, like FedEx, their at agency out of New York gets much more like is on those metrics because they are they're working on a metric, and that's fine. I get mm -hmm. why, right? But for most advertisers, they just want their their brand out there. Blue Cross Blue Shield Insurance or Baptist Memorial Healthcare, the big one of the big hospital systems here. And then the second question that prompts is, do you have another? like a bundle or something that is advertisement on site and yeah. newsletter that you're selling. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We try to package that. I mean, you know, the ideal package is, is email on the site, um, an event back when we were doing real events, we've done some mm -hmm. zoom events, but, um, uh, even a podcast. And so, and we have people who do that. I mean, they're on all the platforms and all the channels. So, okay. I think that's um, it for me right now. Sure. I don't see. I saw some stuff pop up in the chat, but I think it was just someone saying that when they got an offer for twelve dollars a year, they felt like there there must be some scam behind it. Yeah, yeah. It devalue. It's it's. I could do a whole hour on how awful um, dollar a month offers are for local news. Local news is in, in a disaster right now, and it's a real. I mean, it's just a. You know, it's it's a borderline threat to democracy. I mean, it is that bad. And it's only getting worse. And to devalue it that way, when everyone knows that paid subscribers, everyone behind closed doors knows that paid subscriptions are the are what are going to make or break broad-based local news sites like ours um, that that are trying to cover the all of a city, right? They're not going to do it on advertising because if you're selling advertising, you can do it, and we're doing it pretty successfully. But you're you are almost inherently limited because you cannot even Gannett cannot compete with Facebook and Google. Facebook and Google are multi-billion dollar high-tech machines that are gonna sell advertising better and more effectively than any newspaper in this country in mass on a network level. And if you look, even pre-COVID, the, the local news was finding that, wow, we'd been running up our advertising, digital advertising numbers for years, and it was all network-based. There's a lot of pop-up videos, there's a lot of pop-up ads. And it was, that's why so many local newspapers got on the machine of like five things to do and seven things to, to see and, you know, all that kind of stuff, the clickbaity kind of stuff that might be substantive in it, but the way it was presented was very clickbaity was because, and all the tabuli stuff at the bottom of their sites and all that junk was all about running up the, the pennies they were getting, adding up to millions in the big companies from the network advertising and all of it, virtually all of it plateaued pre-COVID. They were, it, it had hit, in many cases, it had begun to drop down. And this is across like local news site, local TV sites, local newspaper sites, and so on. So I found the question that I thought existed and then thought didn't. Um, Sam was asking, do you report analytics to them, Eric? Yeah. And I think maybe that was for about FedEx or yeah. just every advertiser. Like, what are they getting? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, FedEx needs really detailed, I mean, their agency needs really detailed analytics so that they're hitting the right CPM and all their kind of buy and all their sort of motivations and the way they work for FedEx is satisfied. The local uh, store wants to know that um, it was seen, it was, you know, how many, you know, we if, if it's a breaking news, they want to know how many breaking news alerts went out because we guarantee them a minimum, but we can't know how much breaking news will happen in a month. Um, they they want to know how many people, give or take, are on that list. We'll, we'll give them open rate, but they're not like, dissecting it and converting that very and then there's some people in the middle who do some of that but we try to price things pretty fairly where they don't feel taken advantage of and where we're setting ourselves up for them to be frustrated because maybe they didn't get you know quite the, the number of clicks they needed so so we do provide yes long story short we do provide um, a certain amount of data based on what they want okay and then John is asking and he's he prefaces yeah. with it, that it might be coming up um, John just was a great segue to my next bullet point. Oh, thank you, John. He's also thank clairvoyant. You. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I can talk a ton about this, but um, I will um, say we uh, we we use SendGrid sort of as our email service provider. So e we use SendGrid on the back end, but. 99% of editorial emails, well, actually 100% of editorial emails that go out, the newsletters that go out, are managed through our CMS, through our content management system. So we wrote our own, when we were, when we got funded and we started in May of 2018, we assessed various content management systems for what we wanted to do 
um, there was not a good solution out there unless we were going to spend way more money than we wanted to spend on something like ARC, which is, the, and we couldn't even get ARC at that time. ARC is the, the system that Washington Post uses and was written by Amazon. So it was too expensive and they really couldn't even, they, were, they couldn't even get to us even if we wanted to buy it. We didn't want to do WordPress. I mean, there's all, all these, WordPress is great. There's a bunch of good options out there for us and what we wanted. We couldn't get what we wanted and we knew we wanted to be heavily email driven. So we custom coded through the you know, API, through the, what is it, application protocol interface, or whatever, from the CMS to SendGrid. So when you build the morning edition, you build it in the CMS, it's a web-based product. Um, you, when you post a story, you can hit preview email and send it right from there. Those week and review ones we do, you, you, can, you build all those in the CMS. Some are, you know, you hit send on, some have to go get approval from an editor. Others are scheduled, like the 4 a.m. morning edition that's so essential to us. It will go out at 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, you can stop it, but it pretty much, it will unless you stop it. And it will pick up everything that's on the site at that time and send it out to everyone. And so we use SendGrid for, you know, so most of the newsroom never goes into the SendGrid interface. They just stay in the CMS. But they, um, uh, we also use SendGrid now for a lot of marketing emails, for onboarding campaigns and so on. And obviously we go into SendGrid for that stuff. Um, we are, you know, a B, B plus, depending on our day with SendGrid. I mean, I, I, if you're a small organization, I'm not sure they're the right answer. I wouldn't recommend them. They were more robust in terms of what you could do in terms of from a programming point of view and, and hooking into them. They were, there was a lot we could do with them. And that, that was why we ended up with SendGrid. Um, but I don't think if you're a smaller shop, they're a particularly great solution. I don't know if somebody from Sengrid is on the phone. If you are, you can call and <laughs> later. So, what, and I mean, talk some more about tech stack in a bit, because in the, when I get to our failings, uh, the section about our failings, but um, the, um, so let's see, make sure I got it. I hit everything there. Yeah, so back to our story. Again, we're launched because out of a, really a sense of civic pride, People are angry about what has happened to the commercial appeal. Um, it has been uh, decimated, it, like all, most all local papers. You know, the, the deadlines, the print deadlines have been moved up and up and up. So anything that happened after six, seven, eight o'clock, anything like that, wasn't making the print edition. Um, the print edition is getting smaller and smaller. Core readers of newspapers tend to be older, um, upper middle income uh, and high income very traditional news consumers are furious and then they're getting this paper that doesn't have last night's box score or last night's city council vote, but it does have top 10 rooftop bars in Nashville um, and they're furious. And so that is the backdrop against we launched. But we're, we're, it is also a backdrop that we knew we got to get all these paid subscribers and they're going to tend to be older. They're going to tend to be higher income because they, they're not going to think twice about paying what we our launch number, which was $7 a month. And again, we've since raised it. So and we thought really hard about launching a print edition because we wanted to reach those core newspaper readers. But it's just, I've been in print publishing one way or another magazines and newspapers and community newspapers and so on forever. I, it's just too expensive. So we just couldn't make the dollars work. But we knew we wanted to send uh, a morning edition at four. We weren't quite sure of the time, um, but ended up at 4 a.m. Every morning you would get that day's edition and it would look uh, and feel very much like a traditional newspaper. And I'll bring one up in a second, uh, if I can find it. Oh, I closed that, that's awesome. I will bring it up in a second here. Um, but we, we didn't, it, this is not a PDF replica, right? This is not a um, uh, sending you what, what the, the local news industry calls replicas, which are basically enhanced PDFs, and which they are having a lot of success with. And most of them launched those and thought they would never work, but they just launched them kind of for a bunch of dumb reasons. Actually, they find that they have a very oops, high engagement rates on them. People will pay for them. It's mostly older readers, traditional readers, which is part of my story here. But those replica editions, which most local newspapers have, actually have had way more staying power than, than, um, than the news publishers thought. We, so, but we didn't want to do any of that stuff. We, um, we just wanted a you know, straight up email edition that we could put out that was tied to the CMS that would feel like it's not as close to a newspaper as you could get, but it would evoke a newspaper for traditional readers, okay? Um, and so what we launched, and it won't look great on this sharing, but whatever, 
Oh, it's all messed up. Uh, and you can sign up for it because I know you will. Um, the do, 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 let me make sure I don't share like my inbox because that'd be embarrassing. Um, the um, so here's the morning edition, and so logo. And even if you look at our logo, it's, we're the Daily Memphian. So we thought about just calling it the Memphian, and a lot of people reference us as the Memphian. But Daily was a reference to daily newspapers. We were sort of what our our line is, and it's the truth is, you know, local journalism didn't fail. It was the business model behind local journalism that failed. There was there was never a decreased demand for local news, not particularly. It's just they couldn't sell enough subscriptions or certainly just sell enough print advertising to support the, 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 the business model. So we said, let's not reject, reject everything. We don't have to be Axios. If you like Axios, that's great, but we don't want to write everything in bullet points, you know, if you know what Axios is. And they're very successful. It's great. It's a great business model. We didn't need to be BuzzFeed and be kind of hip and hipster and all, you know, kind of, you know, contrarian. We just wanted solid local news that was broad, as broad-based as we could afford and that was presented in a very simple format. And so... Is simple, things as simple as using a serif font. So there's a lot of theories you should be using a sans serif font, it's more readable on a screen, which is probably true, but we wanted to evoke a newspaper. We wanted to evoke just this simple kind of traditional sense, and this has changed a little since we launched, but not a whole lot. And people love this, and this is our flagship product. And they, as you go down here, you see all the news, and we do you know, tons of news, and you get into um, you know, some advertising on here, and then you get in some sections and so on and so forth. And it's very simple. People still love it, but they loved it at launch. Something that simple, that readable, coming at 4 a.m., uh, you know, we had a marketing campaign that was like news in, news in your driveway, or I can't remember, it was, more, it was catchier than that. But it was basically this notion of replicating that notion. You got a newspaper every morning. By the time you woke up, it was in your inbox, not on your doorstep, but you could have your morning coffee and you could read the news. And what, and it was, you know, you could kind of skim the whole thing and kind of a sense of what was going on, which was bad from, which was and is bad from the point of view of driving people to the site and subscriptions but it, people are really attached to reading this every day and getting a sense, a quick snapshot of the whole news and then selecting the stories they want to read. The, um, what that meant, as I try to manage all this, um, we, let's see if there, anything else I want to hit on that. Again, I talked about the older readers um, and we knew we got to keep it simple because we're trying to get older readers. And we're not just old people, by the way, but that was the core group, right? That, um, that we wanted, we had to get them onto the site. We knew they would, and we were hearing on feedback, please do a print edition. And we told before launch, we're not doing a print edition, but we're gonna make it readable. We're gonna make it easy. The site itself, which has gotten a little bit more complicated since launch, was super simple, still is relatively simple. We don't allow video advertising. We don't allow pop-up advertising. We keep it really simple. And it's gotta be the reader first, okay? That is the key to this for our market and our mission. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do, you should never do video advertising. Your business model is different than ours. I'm just saying for us, that was a big consideration. Um, and so the, um, that, that sense of this kind of simple, easy to read thing you could look at. I remember I got all this incredible feedback on it from people. And the best one ever was a guy who said, look, you know, for the first time I can get that email. I can just look at it. And for the first time in five, 10 years, I feel like I know what's going on in Memphis. And I got variations on that from a hundred people. I mean, and emails and just, it was crazy how popular it was and, and the site itself. So to, to, to sort of play that out, our year one goal for paid subscribers was 4,500. That's what we wanted to get to paid at $7 a month after 12 months of launch. We hit 4,500 in three and a half weeks. By the end of three months, we were at 75,000. And we obviously slowed down since then because that was just this crazy, you know, but we got those core readers over from the commercial appeal into the site and we've retained, um, it's something like 85, 90% of those original subscribers. It's kind of a nutsy number. So again, um, what that meant for us is, uh, and I don't know if, yeah, what, what that meant for us was, um, Get my notes here. So unexpected things. And I'm, I swear I'm going to get to, I mean, that was a celebration and we were smart about that. There's a bunch of stuff we did that we were really bad about. So I'm not just sitting here bragging. We knew the core group would be older. 
um, and not tech, that tech savvy. So there was a couple things we had to do. So we knew we needed to have good customer service. We hired two local people um, who, we didn't hire them because they have Southern accents, but they happen to have Southern accents. I'm telling you that was important. Um, and we, we, we ultimately only needed one, but the woman, Cassie Brooks, who is our lead customer service person, is like employee of the year every single day. She's just, we just lucked into her. She's this fabulous human being who can spend a half an hour with someone on the phone, helping them navigate the site, find what they want, understanding what's in the email edition, how to, how to they can't find their email edition, it's in their drunk, junk mail, um, they've lost it, somehow they hit unsubscribe, they didn't know it. Again, as I said, when we launched, when I was showing you that very nice, simple email subscribe page, we didn't have that, so it was hard to manage your emails. And as we added emails, people were getting confused, particularly older less, and less tech-savvy tech folks. Um, what we realized, though, through having live customer service that was down the hall from me, right? I mean, just down from my office. And then from being connected to the community and doing, a, at that time, it seems odd to be in person with people, but to be live and in person, we did, you know, I would do every, I was joking with Ashley before we started, I mean, every Kiwanis group, every Chamber of Commerce, every church group, I said yes to everything I could do. And I, whether it was five people or it was, you know, a couple hundred. And I would always get feedback, get feedback. And what became clear was that um, the morning edition was essential to what we were doing. If a story didn't appear in the morning edition, it didn't exist to a lot of readers. They never saw it. And what I finally had a friend who's older, a doctor, a really smart dude. We were kind of talking about this stuff. We ran into each other and having coffee. And he goes, look, Eric, I don't know what you're talking about. You're talking about the morning edition. You're talking about email. You're talking about the app. Here's what I do. And he gets his phone out. And he's an older guy, so the phone is like this big, right? Like it's the, the I don't even know where they make these phones anymore. So he's got this giant phone. I don't know what brand it is. And he, but it's, he, and he goes, I get here. And he goes, and he, I can kind of, he's okay with me looking at his shoulder. And he's in his Gmail. And he brings up a morning edition. He goes, I get this. This is the Daily Memphian. I, I don't know what you're talking about. So then I, I, go, I scroll through and I read and then I hit a story I like. And then I read it. And then I want to see what else you have. So I go back to wherever it was I just was, which was his Gmail, and I keep scrolling. So basically, they don't use the morning edition. A big chunk of our readers do not use the morning edition as, oh, I'm going to click on this third story, and then I'm going to stay in the site. They use it as the table of contents. It is the front page of the Daily Memphian to core readers. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just kind of, it was a mind shift. We thought we'd be teasing people into the site and they would stay in the site. That's not what they do. And it also meant that, again, when we were posting stories, because of course, you know, news happens throughout the day, we're posting stories after that didn't go in the 4 a.m., we had to work really hard to make sure people saw them. We have an afternoon edition that would capture all those stories that went up between 4 a.m. and 4 p.m., but we had to be really careful. And it's still something we really struggle with is, is making sure people see stories without being repetitive and, again, acknowledging that they use this as the front page. It, they don't necessarily use the app or, the, or social media or SEO. I mean, we have lots of readers who do that. But that was critically important to us, the way in which people used email. Um, the other thing I would remind everyone of, and you know, just with, you know, your your users, your readers, your subscribers, tech support problems are your tech support problems. Um, if if they can't read uh, an article because the images aren't loading, and it's because of their setting, that's your problem. It's not their problem. And that gets back to employee of the year every day, Cassie Brooks, who can sit and and walk people through every basically at this point every email client, um, every browser type. And, 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 you know, un help them understand what's going wrong, that they can't get what they want. And a lot of that can be emails that go into junk mail or go into, they just, they accidentally unsubscribe or it's on their spouse's email and they, they're on a different computer, but they don't know they're on their email. All those problems are your problems, particularly when you have paid subscribers. So it's just something you have to brace yourself for, you know, I mean, um, and, 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 there's, and it's actually a great way to learn a lot about what, how, your, user, how your, your subscribers and your readers use your stuff and to get feedback and then and to create a connection with them. Um, I mean, it's just we get so much positive feedback about Cassie because people feel like, oh, my God, she was so nice. I was so embarrassed. I spent 20 minutes on the phone with her and we found it and we figured it out. You know, we hear it all the time. And so that's critically important. I have a, an interesting question yeah. um, about that. Uh, 
because you have all of these different editions and I could technically go in and manage my subscriptions and subscribe to all of it, but we're thinking about people who may not be familiar with that kind of process. What do you do in the newsletters to make people aware of the other editions? Um, not enough, probably. Um, we, we, we have a manage preferences at the bottom of the page and that we, we always had that, but it was wonky, but mm -hmm. now we take it to the nice, relatively clean uh, page that we, we set up. Um, we do more, um, on within articles and within the site of like, Hey, you're reading a high school sports story. Did you know you can get, you know, the high school sports weekend review by just giving us your email here. And we do pretty, we're successful at that, of putting embeds topically relevant embed embeds for food in food stories um politics in politics stories business and business stories um we do a lot on social media with paid funnels and and seo with paid funnels pushing people to give us their email and sign up for the, the weekly business and review or weekly food and review and you can you know obviously you can do all the creepy targeting stuff on facebook and seo so you can find people who like food and give them Hey, send, give us your email and you'll get Jennifer Biggs, our food writer, you know, every week in your inbox. And we do really well with that. That was part of how we added so many emails last year. Um, but do we, in, in the high school week in review, do we also promote um, the Grizzlies basketball week in review? We don't, and we probably should, I, you know? I mean, actually, the more I think about it, but we don't, we don't cross promote within email very effectively. But you have, do you, are, are the calls to action in the articles? Yes. Are they like, uh, are they dynamic based on what a person has already subscribed to or like where they are in your CRM so that they're seeing something special or is it like generic? Like if this is a sports story, we say there's a sports newsletter. If it's generic, it's okay. not, um, and, and that gets to some of the failings. I mean, if in hindsight, I don't know how we could have done it in the time frame we were on to launch, but mm -hmm. that we we did some things very smart. Like so, again, you don't have to. There's no if you're building if you're the person posting the writer or editor or whatever posting a high school sports story, um, you don't have to worry about picking the right embed. It, it's mm -hmm. done for you, so that's good. Yeah, we did, that was smart, and that was no small thing, and we made that work correctly. It is not dynamic to, to, to saying you already subscribed to this, so don't, don't waste that space on the page. And I wish it were. We could probably do that through SendGrid. It, it's part of the pros of SendGrid is the API is very powerful, but mm -hmm. we'd have to spend some programming time to do it ourselves. I mean, and I mean, that gets to some of our failings. We, we, we did really well with writing a CMS and website. We did really well with the email integration and SendGrid. Piano is our paywall provider. Um, and we did, we got that set up and that was good. And then we launched. And within a few months, we were like, oh no, <laughs> these things don't really talk to each other. And we screwed that up badly. And I think it was John or somebody who asked about tech stack. So we, we and we still two and a half years later, we've made progress, but every time we, we make progress, it's kind of two steps forward, one step back, you know, cause you're, so, Today, if we were to launch, we, Piano, which at the time was just a paywall provider, has since bought um, an, an, an email service provider, I can't remember what it's called, but it's integrated into Piano. We probably would have used that. Not that it's perfectly integrated, but it would have been a little less removed, you know, mm -hmm. and probably a little less expensive because um, we're paying SendGrid a lot of money, we're paying Piano a lot of money, et cetera. So, um, so some of those things we that we just didn't anticipate, like the very good point you just made, um, we just didn't think it through. I mean, bluntly, you know, we we just it, it just but but we did think it through in the sense that we have the power to do it because we went with this very robust email solution versus a kind of out of the box one where you're like, this is what it does, and if you don't like it, too bad, you know. Um, so do you have another question or did you do that? I don't have one. If anyone okay. in the chat yeah, has yeah, one yeah. or, or are you still continuing through I can, your, I, I can go through a few more things or I can stop, you know, I mean, obviously I can talk about this stuff forever. Um, um, uh, go through a few more things. I'll go through a few more things that again, I, 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 back to the, 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 some of the things, but, um, that, that we just didn't do that well. 
were, um, I was trying to find my notes, but the, I, I gave the example of just not thinking through the tech stack quite as clearly as we should have. We've been able to kind of program our way through that. We didn't think through email management anywhere nearly clear, clearly enough. So when, you know, one month after launch, we had all these emails in SendGrid. We had all the, these emails in Piano, because when you sign up for a paid subscription, you got to give us your email. We've got onboarding and billing emails coming out of Piano. We've got email newsletters coming out of SendGrid. And then we had events that we were doing, and we were like, oh, God, we weren't set up to do it in SendGrid. We were doing them in constant contact. And then we signed up for something like Eventbrite, and we're like, oh, my God, you know, we have four repositories for emails. We've since gotten that down to um, essentially two. We use, we use every, it's either you're in Piano because that's where you sign up, and we use SendGrid not just for email newsletters now, we use it for marketing and promotion and um, so on. So that, again, I wish that were one. And we do a certain amount of programming behind the scenes. So when you sign up in Piano, we automatically put your, you, it's part of the terms and conditions, you're automatically signed up for the morning edition and breaking news. Um, we used to sign people up for like five or six or 10 newsletters and then they, everyone made me stop doing that. But I was right and they were wrong. But it was too, it was too many emails. It was, it was too many emails. So I, actually you get, you still get the morning, the breaking and the afternoon email. So those are the three you get. And you can unsubscribe from all of them. Um, we did launch too many newsletters too fast after launch and, and they, were, they were easy to build because we'd been, that was, we were smart about that in the programming and they were a little bit too easy to build. So we launched a bunch before we really thought them through and some cryptic ones that just, that weren't good topics. And it just wasn't, it, we just needed to slow down. It's like, cause you can build it does not mean you should. Um, that was, and again, that would take 90% of the blame on that. Um, I do have some questions coming yeah. through. David, would you like to come on and ask yours? Yeah. Any chance? Seth has the power to to bring you on if you want he to. Says, he said no. Nope. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining that David has a low toned voice and he says, what advice do you have for people, journalists or otherwise, who want to start a local publication versus one that is targeting like other types of niches? Take like a year of naps and then <laughs> launch. Uh, I mean, it's it's been certainly the most edifying uh, and, and kind of remarkable, um, remarkably um, uh, satisfying work experience in my life. I mean, to, to, cause people really love local news and were very, very happy to have what they really felt like and do feel like is their local newspaper. Um, and if you can tap into that, I think you can be successful. People are, again, local news, local journalism didn't fail. It was the business model. So that said, um, it's super expensive. I mean, you know, we have 35 journalists and 20 freelancers. We really need 45, ideally, you know, to really do it right and probably 30 freelancers. Um, but we're already at a $5 million budget. And I mean, that's a lot, that's expensive. And, and it's hard work um, on the advertising side for the reasons I described. Uh, if you go down the network, your ad, then you're gonna pollute your site and you're gonna, you're gonna it's just, you're, you're kind of beholden to outside forces. Um, and then if you're selling directly, it's, it's a lot of work. And we have you know, three, two, two sales reps, an ad director and an ad manager working on that whole process. So it's expensive and it's, it's time consuming. Um, selling digital subscriptions has been, we've been pretty successful at it. I mean, we're kind of weirdly successful at it, but which says less about us, but more about how broken um, the, the industry is. Um, that, you know, a lot, you'd be shocked at the numbers that a lot of really big local newspaper sites that actually, the actual number of subscribers they have is in the, the single digit thousands in very big cities. And that the net rate they get from them is often a dollar to $2 a month. And the retention rates they have are often in the 30%. They're losing 50 to 70% of their subscribers every month. We don't come close, we don't come close to that. Partly I think because we, we've been smart about it, but it's, it nonetheless speaks to how broken the industry is. And there is the whole fact that about, you know, for 15 years, local news was on a, and, and national news was in a like fever dream where they thought they could just give away all their content for free and not charge for it and they'd still make money. And then suddenly the bottom dropped out of print advertising. Finally, it was, it was, it was very obvious what was happening, but it was 
it was just collapsing and they didn't have digital models or digital paywalls or digital subscription models. What that did was train for 15 years, people just didn't pay for local news. They didn't pay for national news. The good news is with New York Times cracking the code and now you look from you know, New Yorker to, to the Atlantic to uh, New York Magazine to every, everything I used to get for free, I now have to pay somewhere between two to, to $10 a month for. I think uh, New York Times is probably $15 a month, which by the way, New York Times, I think I pay 10, maybe I probably pay 15 to $20 a month it's still less than I paid for the print edition when I lived in New York City 25 years ago. I used to, I've done the math and I have a whole thing I won't do. I spent $300 a year on print editions of the New York Times when I was a grad student in New York or working with student loans and I'm still paying less than I paid then. It's absurd. So that's a huge challenge with local news. Um, the other thing we found, like if you're gonna go up against one of the big chains, again, we're a Gannett Gatehouse paper, they are, they are competing fiercely. They've added people. They've protected the newsroom from cuts, which I love as a, as a journalist and as someone in Memphis, the more journalists, the better. But they're, gonna, they're not gonna just take competition easily. They have a lot of resources to throw at a competitor. I mean, we think we'll win this, but it's, it's, it's no small thing to try to uh, compete with them. Um, um, John is gonna come on um, okay. and ask his live. Hey, Eric, thanks for sharing yeah. the story. You, you answered it a little bit, but would love to hear more on um, the team makeup and maybe, I, I think I get the sense it may have changed also from when you started two years ago as you've gone through and, and kind of the breakup between the editorial side and the business ops, um, some of the sales yeah. you're talking about um, and what that looks like as you continue moving forward to, to really hit that sustainability model where it's paying for itself. Right. Um, would love to hear about that. Yeah, so um, of the, t the 10 people not in the newsroom are, again, three, four people in, in ad sales, me, uh, my chief technology officer, a, a product development person who works for him, um, a, a, so a marketing side social media manager, and a director of audience development, a business manager, and customer service. I think that's pretty much everybody on the business side. However, what you really do gotta get away from is thinking about um, and this would be true to the other question about launching a local news site. You got to break all the walls down about about business side versus editorial. You know, for those not familiar with it, I mean, back in the day, literally, if you were in the sales office at the New York Times, you were not allowed in on any of the floors where there were journalists, and vice versa. You were not allowed to ride in the elevator together. I think. I mean, it was a, the separation was severe. What that did was create a culture that um, reporters felt like they wrote stories and turned them in and went on to the next story. Editors edited stories, maybe fought for position on the home page, on the front page, or the you know the, the the business section front page or whatever, and then they walked away. Um, and the you can't and that mentality is really ingrained in newsrooms and traditional journalists. And the truth is, it's a much trickier balance where our director of audience development is constantly feeding, giving feedback to the newsroom, and the newsroom is constantly asking for analytics. And the social media manager, who is a marketing position, works really closely with reporters and editors about what can we do with this story to give it some more traction, get more, not just traffic, because traffic can be empty calories, but quality traffic that converts into subscriptions. And you got to get buy-in from the newsroom that the, the, our lifeblood is subscriptions. So I'm not going to ask you to... Um, sell your soul to, to, or, you know, compromise the journalistic integrity of a story, but how do we make a story have its biggest impact? And there's some resistance to that, even still among some journalists. They don't, they just want to write that story, do the best work they can and walk away. But um, you, you got to find a culture that balances all that. I mean, the New York Times very famously not only said you can talk to each other in the elevator, they took marketing and audience development people and put them in the newsroom and began to put you know, put a marketing person in with the food team and put a marketing person in with the business writing team so that they were constantly talking and thinking about how can this story do better. The marketing person never had any influence about the content of the story, but hey, if you do this, or if we repost it to the front page at this hour, or if we boost it on Facebook, or we change a headline, can't change the content, can't be, but this headline would be smarter and these keywords would be smarter in the metadata and all that stuff. We did, we, we did a, about a C minus on that stuff when we launched. Um, and now I'd say we do a, a B plus to an A minus, you know, that, that we've gotten smarter and better about how we, we brought people in and just, you know, kind of the newsroom has evolved who 
understand that, that you've got to break that dynamic down. Um, so that's kind of the, that, the team, yeah. I mean, that, that I think is partly the team. Um, what else? Someone is oh, giving yeah, a Memphis. shout out oh, from really Memphis. Nice. That's really nice, thank you. A local marketer. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. I, I went to grad school in New York as well. And yeah. I think I was at the very end of the traditional wall model. I think we yeah. ate dinner in the cafeteria of the New York Times yeah, as like a field trip of sorts, but it was 2005. Yeah. So, or, 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 or four. So Bush carry election. Yeah. Like the start of, uh, who is the comedy central? Uh, John Stewart. Uh, yeah. That's the start of that era where, yeah. you know, like Saturday night live, like satirical news was almost truer than news news. Right. 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 At right. a point. Yeah. Um, so if no one has any further questions, we can start to wind down. This is my point in which I'm saying, like, if you have a question, post it now. I loved this conversation. Well, thank you. I, I very much enjoyed where it went. I think that um, it's interesting to think about the concept of the newsletter as the front page. Yes. And, yes. and putting yourself in the mindset of the recipient who does not understand your desire to get them to your site to click around. They understand their desire to go check out the links in the front page they just got in their email. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, we kind of thought that, but it was that something like that would happen, but it was, was and is much more profound and it's a great opportunity. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. It's just, it's just created some challenges that we didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Did you increase the number of stories yes. in there to kind yes. of alleviate that? Okay. Yes, absolutely. We had, we kind of had an artificial cap in the CMS on the number of stories that we could put in the front page. And it, that was, it was a, a big mistake that uh, we, we suddenly kind of woke up and realized, oh my God, I mean, the way people are reading this, if we're not putting in them, that morning edition, we're, we're screwing up and you run again, you run up against some best practices where your emails get too long. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a art, not a science on some level because G Gmail cuts off a certain amount at the bottom, but you know, it, so the, it's, there's no perfect answer to that. Mm -hmm. and, and we have other emails. I think that, you know, aren't so much, they're self-contained articles that aren't the front page. I mean that, that it's just that some of those core products really, really are. And, and I think, I don't know, will be for the foreseeable future. Excellent. All right. I'm not seeing any more questions. I am seeing a lot of people saying um, that your presentation was excellent oh, and well, best nice. of luck. So huge um, thank you. Absolutely. Huge, huge my, thank you. I put my email in there. If people have questions, they're welcome to email me and, and uh, I'm happy to answer anything. Excellent. Do you Slack? Is that a thing you it's do? It's just one, it's one thing too many. I, just, I understand. I mean, I understand. Everyone I, I mean, in the office does. I don't, and they are happier that I don't. So let's let's also. Put <laughs> I mean, I go in there sometimes, and it's always it, it, it creates trouble. So all right, guys. So copy that email address if you wish yeah. to ever ask him a personal yeah. <laughs> one to one question. Use email, the ultimate communication platform. <laughs> yes. Perfect. All right. Well, we are going to be starting our next session with Michael Aft of the new paper in just two minutes. His session is about um, how they launched their paid news newsletter. And um, their model is that they give away a free week and then you are prompted to subscribe or not. And so this, the story there is how they got to 1 million in two years. So kind of a co-founder uh, entrepreneurial story that I'm looking forward to hearing if anyone in this session is joining us there. Otherwise, see y'all on Slack or in um, Eric's inbox. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you Eric. so much. Thanks, Seth. I'll, I'll run into you probably once. Yeah. It's a big small town. Ashley, it's great to meet you. Thanks so much for your help and for having me. I really you as well. I'm, yeah, I loved it. Thank you. Yeah.